Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ellen Durkin, and thank you for that introduction. I've been working in uh, blacksmithing and forging for probably 11 years. However, I've had a pretty long history in art. I have my master's degree in sculpture and drawing, so I guess we'll start there. And there's several other bodies of work that led up to, to this series. So keep that in mind, especially if you're an artist and you're working on your own process or whatever. Uh, let's start off with a little bit of drawing. So this is just a quick iPad sketch where I start off with the human body as my uh, starting point, just like anyone would if they're building a gate or something. They would start off there with their rectangle or square, and then they would fill that space with the shapes that make sense for the project. So my starting point is the female form or just the human form in general. And then I make these pieces to fit around that. This series started based on these large stationary dress cages for my graduate thesis back in 2008. And that was kind of a jumping off point for not only my blacksmith career, but led into a whole other series that dove a lot deeper into uh, the the physicality of the human form and how people address the, the female body, especially in society. Yep. I got Siri yelling at me. All right, so this is a drawing that's about eight foot tall. This was the start of my human form series. Um, like I said, it's eight foot tall, it's about four and a half foot wide, and I started doing these very detailed, large scale sketches and drawings that I work on the same time as my wearable pieces. So they kind of balance each other out, and I'll do a little drawing, and I'll do a little metal work, and I'll bounce back and forth, and it kind of helps me mesh my ideas a little bit together in one unit. And then when I display them as a big body of work, I've got these massive, large scale drawings that relate to all of the metal pieces so people can see the entire thought process through it and that, that it evolves in one space. So you can see here, there's a pair of shoes that I sketched out and then I decided to build them in wood and copper and brass. So the, the base part is carved wood. It's carved very thin and it's made out of cherry and then it's got leather. And the lacing part is all brass. And I did have a model walk down the runway in these as well as stand in them for probably a little bit too long. It was like 30 minutes, 40 minutes during the first time I had a model stand in them. And then I walked a model down the runway in them. I have retired them because they did get a little bit broken. But I like to keep the concept of like this delicacy in metal and make it look like not metal so that lacing is all brass. Here's the top piece that goes. This was the first piece that I built in copper. Um, if you work in any material, normally they tell you to start off like small and build like something manageable. But I had this crazy idea in my head that I wanted to build this giant piece that was like way out of my skill set. So I ran into a lot of different technical issues because my ideas were way bigger than my actual, like what I was capable of doing. So there's a lot of metal forming here, especially in those like ear pieces. And then we did some etching in there. And all the lacing on this is also brass. So the, the hinges that open up in the front are brass. So they're designed like this and then they unhook. So those aren't, um, it's not like material lacing. And I started to get into a lot of hair and makeup to kind of make my whole entire look go together. And then a friend of mine I met probably like five, six years ago, my photographer guy, um, he kind of helped balance out what I couldn't do in photo. So that was a cool, cool connection to have. Um, these pieces aren't in like making order like a year or whatever. So they're kind of all together. And a lot of the women that I work with aren't models. They're just regular 
regular women and I work with all different people. And this was from a show I did in North Carolina. So I was walking into like a, to do a runway show. I didn't know any of my models. I just had my stuff. And there were all these like women that were super excited to wear it. And it's really kind of uh, empowering for them and for me to like be able to find the right piece that makes sense for them. So I, I put them in pieces and if they don't like it or they don't feel comfortable, then I'll switch out the pieces so they feel, so they feel strong and empowered. The head piece is, is bone, it's carved, it's got a leather back that's all leather tooling and the leather tooling matches the, the leather here in the chest part. I did start to add leather in the waist and everything. So when you cinched it in, the metal wasn't stabbing violently into your hips. So a lot of my models uh, early on had to suffer a lot more than they do now. So they can say thank you for that because there a, was a big learning curve in the weight of everything and how it sits. Here is a piece, this is pretty recent within the last couple years. So it's three separate pieces. So there's a front and back to the corset and then the skirt separate and then the bustier is separate. The bustier is brass. It's formed brass and patinaed and it's got like a leather, uh, leather underbust to it. And it's important when you put these pieces on that you have to put them in on in a certain order or the pieces won't sit correctly. Uh, the panels here, there's like one, two, I want to say five panels, and I build them all, I guess, like in an organic symmetry. So when I forge them, I forge them all at the same time. So I'll forge the end of one piece, the end of the next one, and so on and so forth, until they're all at the same, like if you're doing a production of them, so they are all relatively similar. Uh, when I build these pieces, I think of an overall shape that I like, and then I start to kind of break that shape down into smaller pieces. So I move from like a big kind of concept and then shrink it down to little tiny details. And then when I'm working on it, say I finish it and I think it needs like something else somewhere, I, I'll still show that piece. And sometimes when it's going down the runway or I see it, I like, I'm like, oh, it's missing, it's missing this, or it needs, needs another element to it. So it's kind of an ongoing process. These are two more large scale drawings. They're both about eight foot tall. Um, can't remember what year they are, but these kind of cyborg detailed Amazon women kind of keep parading through my work and I think I've got some like later drawings where right now the the figures aren't specific. They're not like certain people. And then later in my work, I'm using like I have friends modeled for me, so I'm making it about them. Here's a piece. Uh, it's a corset piece, and it's got a neck. Um, like a collar. I've been doing a lot of these like collar pieces and these like restrictions around your uh, around your throat for like years and um, they've been it's been in my drawings all these kind of contraptions like around your throat been in my work for probably since 2008 ish and they're now like evolving into my metal work at a level that I can complete them in the extent that they are in my drawings. So this piece is all hand cut with a jewelry saw. So you pierce a bunch of little holes and you go in with a little saw and you saw all these panels. So um, Ellen, could I just, uh, do you have a question on this one? Now, did you yeah. start with sheet steel on this and then cut it or? Yeah, so I made a template. I wrapped myself in plastic and clear tape. And then I made like a rough template. And then I took that template and I put it on steel. And I trace my patterns out onto the steel and I cut out like what one, two, there's like, I want to say at least six or seven panels on that, that I would cut out separately. And then naturally when I went to put it all together, like little tabs that are supposed to go like this and overlap, like were not like the, I had to like forge it. So everything lined up. So once I, once I made the template, 
I thought I was like good and I was like I can just put it together and then I went to put it together with like the compound curves of the figure everything went like and I was like oh no <laughs> so that was a learning curve and it hinges in the front so like the front's a big hinge and then the back has all these little tiny tiny hooks this piece is not very adjustable so you either either squeeze in it or you just don't breathe at all. Um, then there's a wrist piece in here too that you can see. There's a couple of those, so. I think that was probably one of my earlier pieces where I started to work in sheet. Uh, these are just some sketches. They're not like overly important or anything. I just think it's uh, key to, for people to know that like I personally do a lot of sketching in my work. I draw all over everything and anything and in no logical order so my sketchbooks are not in like this is from 2008 it's like i lost this and then i found it again so it's got stuff in it and and it's not even facing the same direction like it's upside down and backwards and anyone that's going to go through my sketches good luck with that so i do a lot of sketches on and if I'm doing like big sketches and stuff, I have a roll of paper in my shop that I use because I like to redraw things or um, paper bags are really good for making your templates. So you can see there's a lot of these like neck pieces and face coverings and these kind of like keyholes in the, in the belly. Um, here is one of my earlier pieces that I did with sheet metal. And you can see that I'm combining the, like the jewelry piercing, like hand cutting techniques, and also leather at this point. I got some leather tooling. I don't know, I ended up with it from somebody and anything that I can incorporate into my work, basically like drawing. So leather tooling allows me to basically draw in leather. So I just kind of started mimicking the patterns that I had in the steel, in the leather. So to create like one like solid piece. This was the first face covering that I did. Um, you can see I carved in like the jawline and like your muscles here and your collarbone. And it restricts your, your movement and everything in your neck and your face. It also added these like kind of wing space pieces. It keeps you, I guess, away from people as well. Uh, the detail in the bustier part is mimicked in the, the hips. If you look closely, and it's also up in the shoulders in the leather. So I design these as like one unit so everything makes sense together, but I also separate them depending on who's wearing the piece and what kind of matches their persona or their vibes or whatever who have it. Uh, Ellen, can you take a question or two? Yeah, go for it. Uh, so we had one question. Are you thinking about the making problem, the fabrication problems, as you're doing the design, or is the yeah. design paramount and then you work out the rest later? Um, yeah. As I do this longer, I do have to consider how the pieces are going to sit and how much they're going to weigh and how, um, how they come apart. Because these skirts, they bolt in, like, several places, so they come apart in two or three pieces because I can't keep this massive like thing around. So I design them so they, they bolt and then I can stack them inside each other when I travel with them. So it makes it easier. So yeah, there is an element that you, you do have to consider like how it's going to attach, where it's going to attach. Cause I don't want the attachments to be um, like crude and like I need them to be part of the piece. So people don't know. So like the piece here, this one attaches on the sides and like hooks on the bottom for like the skirt. So this comes up, the skirt comes apart in two pieces. And then I also had to think about what's sitting on like the chest and the torso because how far that's gonna come down is gonna affect where it's gonna hit the skirt. So whether I do like a drop skirt like here, so it's cinched in at the waist and the panels come down and the skirt hangs lower, that has to be considered. So if I make the skirt too high and like, especially with this piece, the corset sits low, like you can't, you, you won't be able to move. So, yeah, there. it's all a learning curve. I built a lot of pieces that I was like, well, that didn't work, and I can't move in that. I did get stuck in a door frame once, but um, 
I think a couple of models got stuck in a door frame. But, uh, eh. You had models get stuck in a door frame? Well, we had to do a show and the runway, we had to go through like a normal size door. And I had to like use my foot to like shove them through the door. So they kind of fell out onto the runway and it was, it was pretty funny. And then I had to yank them back in the door frame as gracefully as possible because the dress like just didn't, didn't fit. Um, yeah. So this piece, uh, this has a lot of pierce work in it and then a lot of different forged work. Um, if you go to like the close ups of it. So I started working with this idea of like lockets and things that you keep in lockets and also the idea of a triptych and it's like a uh, religious background and how it tells a story and combining that with uh, a lot of different Victorian references, like all the, the, the filigree work on here was inspired by um, like a Victorian wallpaper that I liked. So I took that wallpaper and I kind of simplified it to, to a point that I liked it. Um, and both those doors hinge open and the little roundy tab in the belly kind of, it hinges up. So like when she's on the runway, she kind of, I guess, like exposes it um, to the audience. And the back on this piece, I don't have a picture of it right here, but it, it's similar to the front. It's got filigree work down the, down the spine. And then depending on how tall the models are, what they have the head pieces on, sometimes they run into door frames. It's always exciting. Um, just some more sketches, ideas, just to show people. Like I said, they're just sketches all over the place. Um, when I do my sketches, I like to think about how I'm putting things together, how they're going to attach. So when I'm drawing, I'll be like, ooh, let's see if I can, oh, let's, let's blow up this area a little bit in my head and kind of get in there and maybe there's something else. And, but when I'm making the pieces, they, they change, they evolve, and I see different things. So if a piece kind of I'm working on it and I've done a sketch in one, one direction and then it feel like it doesn't feel right when I'm working on it, um, I'll, I'll change it because I don't do any of this for money. So there's nobody being like, it has to be like this or you have to have X amount of hours in it or whatever. I just kind of take all of the practical stuff that normal people worry about. And I'm just like, never mind. I'm just going to make it the way I want to make it. And then I don't have to deal with the restrictions that come with when you're doing a commission piece and, and you're on a time frame. I can just like dive into it as deep as I want. It can take as long as, as long as or short as I want. It's not like the most sane process, but you know. Um, let's see. This has a lot of detail work in it. This is a, this is different than some of the other pieces. We'll like circle back to this skirt a little bit later. I think there's uh, another picture. This is like a tree branch skirt that I did. It like drops down off the waist and um, then I gold leafed the edges on it. So it's a little different style than my regular pieces. Um, I still love this piece. People ask if I like have a favorite piece and stuff. Um, I do like this one. This piece was based off of a lot of different Gothic architecture and like rose windows and, and that front panel on the skirt hinges open as well. It's a two part hinge. So you have that triptych religious reference in there as well as the, the Gothic cathedral references in there. And um, the, those arches in, in the bottom piece and the, there's a round part on the skirt that's also based off a rose window and it's mimicked in the face piece. So the metal face piece, the first hinge is based off a rose window and then it opens up again to the copper chasing repose face and the collar on that, the center piece is copper and then the sides are leather. Um, getting the leather to fit was a little bit awkward because I had to like strap it on my face and like burnish it to my to my body. Everything's a little awkward, but um, that leather piece fits nice. So this skirt's a little bit heavy. The next slide always takes a minute to show up. But here's a close up of that face piece that I was talking about. Um, yeah. If you, like I said, in my drawings, these like face coverings have been in 
have been like kind of repeating themselves as a concept for years. I started out because I wanted to do just like a plain face covering and kind of test my chasing repose skills. The so chasing repose is taking like a flat, flat piece of metal and then raising your shape out of that flat piece of metal. And then you can use pitch, which is like a pine tar base of different versions of it. And it's basically like a hard clay, more or less, with plaster in it that backs that you can fill in your complicated shapes with so you can forge into them. So that makes sense. Uh, so I wanted to test the limit of my chasing repose skills and my sanity. And then I thought that it would be fun to have it hinge open. And then I thought it would be more fun to have it hinge open twice. So um, that's it open all the way. Uh, this piece on the runway is super cool as well because it has a little bit of that surprise element that the audience might not see coming. And when I do my runway shows, they're not like regular runway shows, they're more of a performance art thing. So they're nice and slow and they're very performance art based instead of like a runway where you're just kind of like threading your stuff and like trying to promote people buying it. Like I'm not trying to sell you anything, obviously. I'm just trying to put it out there in a way that like I like to see it. Uh, I think the next one is a video piece. It does have a sound. I just wasn't smart enough to figure out how to make you guys hear the sound. A um, couple years back, I started working with the concept of using um, not only the space piece, but I wanted to do a runway show with women of all different ages. And I just wasn't sure how I was going to pull that off and like the space that I needed to pull it off because when I do my shows, I generally don't have any funding, so I'm just doing it all on zero dollars. Um, but this video was kind of like a turning point for that and it shows up later in my runway shows. Ellen, can you take a question or two? Yeah. All right, uh, so let's see. Um, your work clearly celebrates the beauty and power of women and women's bodies, but it also constricts and constrains women's bodies. So can you speak to kind of your theme that, with that kind of contradiction there? Yeah, and I think there's a contradiction in the, the history of women's fashion in itself, where if you look at a lot of clothing, even from like the 50s and the 60s, your, your clothing is very, very decorative and it's borderline non-functional. Like I love my like vintage dresses, but you can't walk in those things. You can literally walk like, like this. So there's like this idea of like women being this like solely decorative, non-functional element, which I find fascinating. And even the history of like corsets and clothing, like you were constantly just laced up into like a million different things to just like exist. So like your existence as a woman has always been kind of restricted. And like in my work, there's an idea of like power and strength that uh, I guess comes from being vulnerable. So like you're, you're kind of physically vulnerable and you're not actually protected by these pieces. So that they're an armor in a sense of um, like an emotional armor more than a physical armor. But uh, when people get inside these pieces, it's interesting to watch the, the shift in their, in their demeanor, their personality and stuff. Like it, it's cool. Um, Cause I've done a lot of events and watching people in them is one thing. And then when you're in them, it's a totally different experience. Like you don't feel don't feel vulnerable because you're kind of making everyone else aware of their own vulnerability by you presenting yourself in a very, um, I guess, like socially different way. If that makes sense. Feel free to ask more questions. I'm just Thanks, uh, So on the technical side of it, uh, do you use any CNC on your, uh, on your work or is it all hand forged? Um, all the pieces that you saw are like all hand cut. So I'll hand cut things when I'm doing one-off pieces. If I'm doing production jewelry stuff, I'll, I'll design it in AutoCAD and get it laser cut. 
um, Pierce work is very tedious. It's not my favorite, but if I'm doing like a one-off of something like this stuff, then I'll, I'll suffer through it, I guess. So for the most part, it's just forge, hammer, anvil, and just beat on it. Yeah, and yeah, beat on it carefully. <laughs> you know, Thanks, really morph things to your power, I guess. Um, yeah, feel free to fire off more questions, or if I get too ADD and I start wandering, because it's been known to happen. Um, this is another photograph by my friend Joe, who we've done a lot of collaborative work at this point together, because I think it's important to find people that you can collaborate with, that kind of understand where you're coming from, and they can put their own kind of take on it that you can't necessarily uh, do. So. Uh, Find people that are better at things than you are, but so you work well together. Um, and I work with a lot of different models, but I've got some of my regular models that kind of keep coming back for more torture and stuff because they, they like working with me for whatever reason. I'm not really sure, but um, this is a friend of mine, and we shot this on the, the floor, and it just gives a different a different presentation of the piece depending on who's wearing it and how it's displayed. And that became a really big part of my work early on anyway, that it was important for it to be on the figure and not just like a decorative element that people couldn't um, wear. Because when I started, people were like, well, can't you just make it like decorative and it just can sit there? And I, that wasn't enough for me. Uh, I think the piece is actually become alive and have a much more powerful presence when people are inside of them. And then it changes depending on who's, who's wearing it. This is Corey. I don't shoot a lot of men in my work. I have a couple of times, but it has to be the right piece for the right person. So like it has to make sense on all levels. And there has to be a certain level of trust with everyone that we're working with our models and my photographer and they have to trust I have to trust me to, you know, represent them accurately. And that's an important part that people don't do things that they're uncomfortable with or like pushed into. Uh, this is my friend Jess. We started this series uh, three years ago when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. There's more to this series if you follow me on social media and stuff, but um, uh, the work started to shift, not only from the metal work, it started to go from like the process of the metal work to the people in the work. So it became heavily about the person themselves and their story. And then I painted her white and gold leafed her and I think it was probably freezing in the shop when we shot these pictures. There's me looking devious painting her. Um, some more sketches, face coverings, filigree leaves. Here's Jess again. We shot this in the summer after her um, chemo treatments. Uh, this piece is probably an earlier piece. We had a limited amount of time to shoot the pieces depending on her treatments and like when it was, when she was feeling okay to shoot. So whether the weather was a million degrees or not, we just kind of went for it. And it was a million degrees when we shot these pieces outside. Um, this is just again during my runway show after, after the chemo treatments and I think she was she was doing the radiation. So I designed this piece for her. So this skirt's pretty lightweight because I'm super nice. And then I had the top piece. And then like a week before the show, I um, decided it needed this collar. So I cut this collar out like a week before. Um, I had to design it so it was like around the neck because she had her port down here. So we had to avoid the port. You know, like if you're gonna torture somebody, you might as well be semi nice about it. And I did all the makeup and stuff for this show as well. 
uh, more collars, sketches, some eyeballs showing up that you can see in some of my later pieces. Um, here's just during radiation treatments, and I had made this, uh, I made this bustier piece, and I left the one breast exposed for the, the radiation boob, and then I painted kind of around it to highlight the areas because she was getting like the radiation burns and stuff were coming back. And I made a lacy headpiece for this shoot, which you can kind of see these like headpiece towers and some of my earlier drawings. So these concepts kind of come back in a way. Ellen, we did have a quick question here. So what is the collar piece made of? It's steel. Uh, Sorry? It's uh, 22 gauge steel. It's thin. It's not heavy. It's a little awkward. Cutting it out, the disc was like that big, and I kept stabbing myself in the throat. Um, and I was pushing my saw frame, because your saw frame, I have like an eight inch saw frame, so you can get in like eight inches ish to navigate. So it's a little bit tricky. And there's leather work and stuff in here that. And it was freezing when we shot this. It was really and cool. the headpiece is lace on this one, you said, right? Yeah, it's lace. I made it the night before. I had this idea, and I was like, this would be cool. So I made this lacy headpiece, and I put it on my head, and it looked really stupid. And then um, the day of the shoot, like, her hair was still growing back, so it was really short and stuff. And I was like, well, I've got this headpiece that looked dumb on my head, and it looked magnificent on her, so it worked out. <laughs> More sketches, just I'll sketch on anything, like I said. Concepts of stuff that probably see at some point, makeup, hair. Uh, like I said, sketches, headpieces, there's the design work in there. Repetition of form. I work with a lot of repetition of form. Oh, you can see some of the stationary dress cages in the background up here. This show is from about five years ago, and it's like the solo runway show that I did. And then once I did that one, I was like, oh, there's something here. Like, this is a thing. I did the hair and makeup for this show as well. You can see there's a collar, and this skirt's kind of heavy. Um, so we had a question, do you prefer doing runway shows or do you prefer to do like art installations? I prefer to do performance runway shows. So the last show that I did, I had a friend of mine wrote like 40 minutes of original music for it, uh, opened it with aerial performers. Uh, the aerial performers opened for 10 minutes to the music. They designed a sequence to the music. And then we did a full runway show to the music and it was nice and it was like um, just like a big experience, more like I'm heading towards more like Circus Olay big experience than just like, here's the stuff. So like the more resources I have to make it like powerful, the better. I just want to step it up. I just, I did do a, like a solo exhibition. I have a video that I can post it in the thing with all of the pieces and older pieces. So you can see that, like I didn't just jump out and start making this work. There's, several other bodies of work that, you know, happened before I ended up in this. Um, there's that collar piece. And last year, two years ago, last year, I don't know, can't remember. I did it, I partnered with a friend of mine who does felted pieces. And once we decided to do this collaboration, I was like, we should do, um, let's get, models of all ages so we had 16 models from the ages of 14 to 72 for this show and wanted to combine like the soft fabric of her pieces with like the contrast of the steel in in mine uh, so we did a little mix and match for the runway show and we separated the pieces depending on what made sense with what piece our middle model um, was the only one in full metal with no top on. So when she came out on the runway, like there's hingy doors on the bottom. She like opened the hingy doors on the bottom and then opened the, the face piece. 
So, Ellen, we did have a question here. Uh, first off, everyone in the chat, I know you can't see the chat, but everyone is saying how beautiful the work is. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, but uh, we did have one question. Where do the pieces go after the exhibit? I mean, are they, do you have any of them in private collection, or do you still have well, them? They, like, pile up in a very unsexy manner in, like, the closet, and then when I need them, I have to yank all the pieces out in, like, an chaotic disaster and then I end up with a lot of cuts and bruises from like yanking them out so the storage is not is not very appealing um they look good displayed I just don't have anywhere to display them regularly I would like to say that they're in like a fancy collector's house but they're not they stay stacked up like in in a pile of metal that like only I can dismantle <laughs> Kind of like when you throw a slinky down the stairs and it gets all tangled up. That's what it's like every time. Uh, yeah, sketches, sketches. You can see a little bit of that tree skirt in the one image. It's more neck pieces. So those are gothic arches. Everything goes in arches nowadays for me. I'm sure I'll figure that out at some point. Here is our finale model, and she was amazing. Um, uh, when we picked women for this show, Mm, I'd say most of the women over 35 had never, probably over 30, uh, didn't model. And um, I tried to pick people that I thought would make sense with the pieces. So I didn't put an open call out. I kind of was hunted around a little bit and shot people messages. And she's my brother's friend's grandmom and I called her up one day and I was like hey I got a weird question for you and I like was like remember me I met you once or twice or something and um oops um I was like do you want to walk on my runway show and she laughed at me and I was like no I'm serious like would you walk on my runway show and she was like I'll think about it and I was like well you better think about it and then call me back and say yeah so she calls me back in like two minutes and I was like yes and I was like yes Perfect. Um, once we got her in this piece, uh, she, she was very kind of quiet, like just not loud or anything. But when she hit the runway, she slayed it and uh, she stayed in the piece all night during the after party, um, basically had to like pry her out of it. She loved it, it was great. And a lot of the audience didn't know that our concept was uh, since the models came out in age order, they didn't know that's what we were doing. Because, like, 35, people were like, oh, okay, and then, like, 40. But, like, once you hit over 40 and stuff, people started to see this kind of evolution, and it was kind of, it was, it was neat. And then we closed the show with aerial performance. Uh, this was a piece that I did. I've been wanting to do a pregnant belly piece for a while, and then one of my regular models uh, was pregnant. So I got the opportunity to design this piece, and I started designing it and um, working with different concepts. So I did a belly cast of her at like five months, and then we ended up shooting the piece at nine months. So she was really pregnant, and it was the middle of summer, so it was really hot. And she brought her like baby emergency bag to the shoot. And I was like, we better not be having a baby today because I don't, I don't know if I can deal with this right now. Um, so I designed this belly piece. Uh, there's more pictures of this piece as well. Um, in my initial sketch, I had all these kind of arches and this like architecture and these like Gothic references. But then I started building the piece and I wanted to put these lilies in it because lilies are a sign of like, uh, like fertility and, and um, rebirth and there's like symbolism in there. So I thought doing the different type of lilies in this piece would be uh, relevant. And then I had to design it so it like laced in the top and under the belly. So the belly, this, there wasn't any pressure on the belly part and it laced in the back. The piece is pretty light. She's in like a drop skirt. So I had to um, do the skirt so that it sat below her belly because obviously her waist is, we can't, like, your waist is full of baby. So that changed the concept of that. Um, Ellen, I just want to interject on that last piece. I'm going to do this because I'm the host and I can. Uh, those lilies are just amazing. 
I've seen this post a number of times and every time the lilies are just extraordinary. How did you do that? Oh, um, I have processed pictures of the lilies. I'm doing another talk for like blacksmiths next week and I think I will probably go into more depth about the lilies. So the lilies are made out of one inch by half inch bar stock. Um, yeah, it would require more pictures, but I can add them in my, my next talk. They are a little finicky. I just taught a class on it, and everyone always burns the edges of them, which is totally understandable because it gets very thin. So, yeah, all those lilies are made out of one piece. So from the lily end to the curly parts are one piece. I like to, I guess, visually change the line weight on my pieces. So even with the collar here, I like for it to get kind of fat and then get skinny. Uh, these are some of my more recent large-scale drawings over the past couple of years, so they're about eight foot tall as well, and I'm working on another one right now. That's a giant one, um, so we've got the arches and stuff that keep coming back in my work, and I'm making them more individualized, so I did one of Jess and me, and then I'm working on one of my friend Kristen right now. And then I got the idea that I would drown myself in that first copper piece because I didn't really want to show it anymore and it needed to kind of, it needed to, I don't know, give it a proper burial. It's been like, I'll destroy things for the sake of art at a certain point. And if you know me, you, you kind of know that I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> so uh, I sank myself in it and I got a lot of water in my nose and I don't really get in water very much. But it's all copper. That Joe shot that picture. And then when I was building a copper neck piece recently, that's in my drawing and sitting right next to me. Um, I built it so that it could go underwater and I wanted it to be all in copper and the back's leather because I thought it would be pretty cool to push the limits of, of the metalwork and the photography and also my own endurance of not being able to swim properly and stuff. Because there's nothing like drowning yourself for the sake of art, which I seem to do regularly. But um, I guess like the further I can push my work and push the pieces and just the more I'm gonna Go, and you can see that eyeball in the center, it's the chasing requisite eye. Um, like open your eyes in chlorinated water and try not to look like you're drowning. What else? I think that's the end of the slideshow. Okay, uh, so can we take a few more questions? Go for it. All right, uh, so I always like to make sure we play into the kind of the science and technology end of this. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about the kind of technology that you use? Uh, I know you use, you use coal forge, right? You don't have a gas forge? Yeah, I use a coal forge because I can isolate my heats easier, especially for what I'm doing. The gas forge will give you nice, like, long heats or, like, even heats over larger areas. For what I do, I need to isolate certain areas so I don't make the whole thing crunchy and... Um, I don't burn it up. And plus, once I start doing any sort of scroll work and stuff, I have to be able to isolate pieces. I do use, like, I have oxyacetylene torches. Um, I did put my arm in one recently. I don't suggest it. Um, but, yeah, oxyacetylene, I do have a MIG welder. I don't use it on my work. If I have to torch well, if I have to, like, weld something, as a design element, I'll use oxyacetylene because I can get it nice and tight and clean. And then I just have a double horn penning house, 165 pound anvil, and a couple hammers. I don't have crazy equipment. It's just me in my shop. So anytime I need extra help, I'm usually like trying to throw my leg up on something and like rivet something together. And it's delightfully awful. Uh, so when you're doing your designs, how much thought do you put into what kind of material that you're going to use? Just using your knowledge of how each metal is going to act and the qualities of it. 
I generally work in steel, unless I'm doing like chasing repose stuff, and then I'll work in copper. So like, I have like this piece. So like, this is this is all copper, and then the back is leather. So I mimic the copper in the leather, and then I use the shellac on it. So when I put it under water, it wouldn't get like all misshapen. So generally it's steel. Plus like I can throw steel around and in the car and stuff and it doesn't really get injured too much unless there's like little delicate pieces, but um, yeah. Okay, so a couple more. So on your jeweler saw, um, here we go. Uh, so when you're using those to pierce steel, what blades have you found to be the most durable? Uh, I think I have a larger size blade. I can't remember which one it is though. Um, I don't know. I have to check. I really don't remember numbers for someone that works with like things. I just numbers. I've been working with these blades for years. You think I would remember it. I don't want to give you the wrong size. <laughs> and it depends on what material you're cutting. Like I've done like the 16 gauge steel, obviously that takes longer. 22 gauge is pretty easy to cut. It, yeah. It's more flimsy though. Okay. Uh, so are there any specific problems you came across commonly in the beginning uh, with regard to forging your work? And what did you do to end up kind of fixing that? I know because you mentioned earlier getting the pieces to fit together at the beginning was a, a little bit of a challenge, but how about with the forging? Yeah, so when I got into forging, I was in grad school and I didn't have any training. So there was a forge at school, but it was basically for like sheet metal. It wasn't like a coal forge and it wasn't an enclosed gas forge. Um, so I just basically started putting metal in fire and then like hitting it very improperly. Um, and I kept hitting it improperly until I made really big pieces that were not structurally sound. And then one of my models passed out on one of those pieces during the show, um, but she didn't die and we're still friends, so it's okay. Um, so structural issues, actual forging techniques. And then like, like I said, my ideas are way bigger than my skill set. So at this point, I feel like my, my ideas and my, my skills can kind of like, you know, be friends a little bit. So at the beginning, I had big ideas and big shapes, but I didn't, under, I didn't know how to make them a reality, but I kept doing it anyway and then when I was like well that didn't work and I almost killed somebody guess we'll do it a different way next time um, yeah so skills finding people that you know you can help you or look up to because I didn't train under anybody I just started doing it myself and then I just kept doing it despite all of the you know vanity and it potentially right. not even working. <laughs> uh, so I think I kind of already know the answer to this one. Uh, do you do pieces for dancers, like tribal fusion belly dancers? Um, not yet. I have done a couple pieces for grinder girls. And if you don't know what that is, you're totally normal. Cause I didn't know what it was until um, people wanted them. So there's these, like, it's basically like a metal bra with like rods that come out of it. And then like a basically chastity belt thing with rods that come out of it. And then they use an angle grinder on it, which like I personally try and keep angle grinders away from my body. So I designed these pieces pretty well with retractable rods. So they screw in and then they bolt them so they can be as far away from their body as possible while they're doing this stuff that I wouldn't necessarily do. But they're designed well. So I don't, I don't do too much commission work, not because I don't want to. I just, my niche is kind of, you know, a little bit weird and I don't do production forging and stuff like that okay and uh, I think we have time for one more question uh, so how many basically runway shows or exhibits have you done I've done a lot of exhibits I've done a handful of like runway shows that I'm proud of and like I did two really big ones last year I did the the all ages runway show, which was really cool. And then the year before that I did, or two years before that I did another one. And then last year I also did a 
big like retrospective like 10 year exhibition with like everything in it um i can it's on my youtube channel if you want to look at it and it'll give you like an idea of like the scale of all these pieces and the scale of like all this work which was cool to see together so it takes at least like a year out planning for my next show so when i just do a show and someone's like when's your next one i was like i just barely survived this one give me a minute so, all right, Larry. I think that just about covers it for today. Ellen, thank you so much for being here. Your art is amazing. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan. Uh, definitely do check out Ellen on social media. She is on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, you can check out her website, uh, ellendurkin.com, if you'd like to see more of her work. And there's Potato. Uh, that's kind of an inside joke. If you follow Ellen on social, you know about Potato. Uh, so, uh, thanks to our sponsors at Bon Secours. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, next week, we are going to have with us uh, Dr. Kelly Lambert from University of Richmond, uh, who actually taught rats how to drive little tiny cars to find out more about neuroscience and find out how what goes on in their little rat brains can teach us about what goes on inside human brains. Uh, so, Dr. Lambert's awesome. Definitely do check that out. So until next week, stay safe and stay curious. Thanks again. Mm -hmm.